Okay, today we're going to continue on with meteorology and we're going to start talking about the factors that affect weather. Weather is defined as the local condition of the atmosphere and the short-term changes in this condition. Weather is described by the measurement of atmospheric variables such as temperature, pressure, winds, and moisture content. The primary driving force of weather is the unevenly distributed insulation after, over the surface of the Earth. The Earth receives nearly all of its energy from the Sun. The Sun's electromagnetic energy that reaches the Earth is called insulation. For, it stands for incoming solar radiation. The intensity or strength of insulation depends on several factors, such as the angle, duration, and type of surface that is struck. The angle of insulation is the measure of how high the Sun is in the sky. As the sun rises and sets, the angle of insulation changes constantly. It is measured by the angle made between the sun and the horizon, and the noon sun has the greatest angle of insulation, usually 90 degrees, and therefore noon has the greatest intensity of insulation per unit area. The angle of insulation also changes seasonally. In the northern hemisphere, the lowest angle of insulation is reached during the winter solstice, and the greatest is at the summer solstice. The intermediate angle is reached during the vernal and autumnal equinoxes. The angle of insulation also changes by latitude due to the nearly spherical shape of the Earth. Remember the Earth is an oblate spheroid. As the season progresses, only areas between the tropics of Capricorn and Cancer will receive 90 degrees of insulation at noon. Sunlight is most intense at this angle because the sun's energy is con concentrated in the smallest possible area. At all other latitudes, the sun's rays are more acutely angled, and the solar radiation is spread over a larger surface area and are therefore weaker. The angle of insulation is primarily responsible for the average temperature of a region. The tropics receive the greatest angle of insulation and therefore have the highest average temperatures. The Arctic and Antarctic regions receive very low angle insulation, which explains their very low average temperatures. The duration of insulation is the length of time from sunrise to sunset, or day length, that the sun appears in the sky. A section of the Earth's surface receives the most heat energy when the sun is highest in the sky, and when the duration of insulation is the greatest. In the northern hemisphere, the greatest duration of insulation occurs at the summer solstice, which means that's the longest day of the year. The farther north you go, the greater the day length during the sol solstice. In the Arctic regions, the day length is a full 24 hours during the summer solstice. Because the Earth tilts on its axis 23 and a half degrees, there is always a hemisphere facing away from the sun. This angle is primarily accountable for the changes of seasons and the changes in insulation duration. Most of the sun's energy reaches the Earth in the form of visible light, because light is the type of electromagnetic radiation that penetrates the atmosphere most easily. High energy radiation such as X-rays, gamma, and ultraviolet are absorbed by ozone and other gases in the upper atmosphere. Lower energy radiation such as infrared rays are absorbed by carbon dioxide and water vapor in the atmosphere. Upon reaching the Earth's surface, visible light waves are absorbed, scattered, or reflected. Some absorbed energy ch is changed into the infrared heat waves that are radiated back into the atmosphere at night. In a particular latitude, the average temperatures of land and water can differ for several reasons. The first is that water has a high specific heat, which means it absorbs more, more water before temperatures can change, so it takes longer to warm up or cool down. The second reason is that water reflects low angle insulation better than land. And the third is that convection currents in the water carry heat energy, heat energy deep into the water, whereas on land, heat can only travel by conduction, so it moves from one area to another rather sluggishly. For these reasons, land heats up and cools down more quickly than bodies of water do. That's also why you feel more um, temperature changes farther inland than you do nearer the coast. The presence of clouds in the atmosphere is one factor that reduces the heating effects of insulation. Clouds reflect between 30 and 60 percent of the light falling on them, and they can absorb another 5 to 20 percent. The surface of the Earth can also reflect some solar radiation as well. 
The lower the angle of the sun's rays, the greater amount of insulation is reflected by the Earth's surface. More insulation can be reflected also where the land is light in color or covered by snow or ice. The random reflection of insulation off rough surfaces is called scattering. Tiny particles of airborne solids and liquids such as pollen, dust, pollutants, and water droplets are called aerosols. Aerosols scatter insulation and therefore reduce the intensity. In areas where air pollution is a problem, for example around Mexico City, the amount of insulation can be greatly reduced by the scattering effect. Certain aerosols, such as hairsprays and room deodorizers, contain fluorocarbons, which participate in chemical reactions in the atmosphere that actively destroys ozone. When ozone is destroyed, more ultraviolet radiation reaches the Earth's surface. People are then exposed to greater risks of certain types of cancers with the greater amount of ultraviolet radiation. Air molecules in the atmosphere receive energy either directly from the sun as the heat energy infrared directly heats the air or indirectly as air is warmed by conduction where it con contacts warm surfaces on land and water. Air temperatures is measured with a thermometer with units either in the Celsius or Fahrenheit scales. Air temperature can change due to a number of factors. Changes in the temperature of the earth due to changes in insulation angle or duration. The amount of water in the air or humidity. Greater amounts of water vapor or condensation in the air can add large amounts of heat energy to the air. And also air temperature changes in response to the uneven conduction of heat from warm land and water and by friction caused by moving air masses. So you can see here that because of the Earth's tilt, the air temperature, the average air temperature changes quite a bit above the tropics um, toward the polar regions. Atmospheric pressure is a measure of the force exerted by the atmosphere. Changes in pressure result from changes in the temperature, moisture content of the air, and the elevation. Remember that one atmosphere is 760 millimeters of mercury, or 29.92 inches, at sea level. As temperatures rise, the air pressure decreases because hot air is less dense than cold air. As humidity, the amount of water vapor in the air increases, the air pressure decreases because the light water vapor displaces the relatively heavier air molecules. Humidity is related to the temperature as well. In warmer temperatures, the air can hold greater amounts of humidity. In areas with low humidity and cold temperatures, there tends to be very high atmospheric pressure unless you have higher elevations. Remember, as elevation increases, atmospheric pressure decreases. Wind can be described as the flow of air roughly parallel to the surface of the Earth. Wind is horizontal component of convection and moves heat with the moving air. Energy that is unevenly distributed over the surface of the Earth is transported by the winds. For example, near the poles where the sun is always low in the sky, the ground is cold. Snow and ice reflect much of the insulation the surface of the Earth receives there. But in tropical areas where the noon sun is high and the sky and insulation is stronger, the circulation of winds helps to distribute the heat energy from areas of high heat to areas of low heat. The speed of wind is controlled by the differences in atmospheric pressure. Wherever the pressure differences or gradient are the greatest, the wind speeds will be the highest. Weather maps like the one you see here have lines on them called isobars that show areas of equal pressure. Where the isobars are more closely spaced, the wind speeds will be the greatest. So on this map, which direction A or B do you think that the is going to have the fastest winds? Well, if you take a look, A has the closest spaced isobars, so the wind is going to move more quickly in that direction. Wind direction is controlled by two factors, the atmospheric pressure gradient and the Coriolis effect. Winds always blow from regions of high pressure to regions of low pressure. For example, areas near the equator perpetually have warm, humid air which creates very low pressure areas. Areas near the poles are always cold and dry and therefore have very high pressures. The pressure gradient causes winds to always blow from the poles toward the equator. The greater the pressure gradient, the faster the wind speeds. However, because the Earth rotates on its axis, the winds are always deflected to the right 
of the pressure gradient path in the northern hemisphere and to the left of the gradient path in the southern hemisphere. This effect due to the rotation of the Earth is called the Coriolis effect. However, the winds cannot continue to curve right when they enter a low pressure area. So then they curve back to the left. This movement creates a clockwise circulation of air around a high pressure system and a counterclockwise rotation around a low pressure system. The winds are also responsible for moving surface ocean currents. Most of the surface currents of the ocean move in almost the exact same path as the winds there because they are partly driven by those same winds. So take a look at the movement of the air in this photo of a hurricane in the northern hemisphere. Does the movement of the air indicate that the hurricane has an extremely high pressure or an extremely low pressure? Well, if you take a look, you'll see that it is spiraling counterclockwise, which means it has very, very low pressures in the center. Unequal heating of air over land and water results in breezes near the so shorelines. While the land is warm during the day, air above it rises and cool breezes blow in from the sea. As the land cools off at night, air pressure over it increases and a cool land breeze blows out to sea. This is something that is important. You will see this on your exam, so make sure that you understand how this works. If the earth were not rotating, the winds would be pretty simple. It would always flow from the cold, dry, dense air at the poles that sinks toward the warm, humid, lighter air near the equator, causing more intense winds. The warm air would then rise with the winds and flow back to the poles. That would make two big convection conveyor belts on the Earth. However, that doesn't happen due to the Earth's rotation. In the northern hemisphere, the Coriolis effect causes the winds to be deflected to the right and in the southern hemisphere to the left. As a result, the two big convection cells get broken instead into six primary convection cells, three in each hemisphere. Where the convection cells interact, they produce the doldrums, which are weak winds on the equator. And this is what meaning down in the doldrums means, because this was a sailing term. Because once they hit the doldrums, they couldn't move anywhere with any speed. The trade winds are another band, and the prevailing westerlies and polar easterlies is the third primary planetary wind belt. Humidity is a measure of the moisture or of water vapor content in the air. Humidity is often expressed in terms of the dew point temperature and the vapor pressure of water. The dew point is the temperature to which the air must be cooled to reach saturation. At saturation, the air holds as much water vapor as it possibly can at that temperature. If the air is cooled below the dew point, the water vapor will condense out of the air as dew, fog, or frost. If the dew point temperature is well below the air temperature, then the air will feel dry. As the air temperature and dew point temperature approach each other, the humidity of the air as well as the probability of precipitation increases. The differences between these two temperatures can become smaller in either of two ways. One, the moisture content of the air can increase, raising the dew point temperature closer to the air temperature. Or two, the air temperature can drop, bringing the air temperature closer to the dew point temperature. The relative humidity is measured in the field using a device called a sling psychrometer, which is kind of fun. It uses a wet bulb and a dry bulb thermometer. The rate at which water evaporates depends upon the availability of heat energy the moisture content of the air, and the amount of water surface exposed to the air. Wind can also be important because it moves in fresh dry air to an area and will increase the rate of evaporation. Heat energy can affect the rate of evaporation. Where temperatures are higher, the rate of evaporation is generally higher as well. Dry air can absorb more moisture than moist air, and at a given temperature there is a limit to the amount of water vapor the air can hold. Dry air can absorb more moisture at a particular temperature than moist air can at that same temperature, however. If there is a breeze, then there will be added dry air and more water vapor can evaporate. Surface area also determines the evaporation rates. Where larger surfaces are exposed to the air, the rate of evaporation is higher than in areas where surfaces are small. So let me give you an example. When you sweat and you feel very sweaty, it's usually because the temperatures are high, but also the humidity is high. 
for that reason, there's no um, evaporation coming off your skin. So the sweat just sticks there and it makes you feel hotter. But if you get into a place where there's a cool breeze blowing that moves in the dry air over your skin and that increases the rate of evaporation and that cools you down. A cloud is a large group of water droplets that are so small that they remain suspended in the air. Clouds form mainly by con condensation when moist air is cooled below its dew point. Condensation releases energy, so the cloud formation is an important factor in releasing energy into the atmosphere. To form a cloud, there has to be a warm, moist air, uh, mass of air. This mass of air, because of its higher temperature and because of its greater vapor content, will be lighter than the surrounding air. Therefore, the air mass will rise, and as it rises, it expands due to the decreased air pressure with elevation. This expansion causes the air molecules to stop running into each other so much, which causes cooling to happen, which is called adiabatic temperature change. Adiabatic warming can happen as the cold air masses in the clouds cause the whole structure to sink and compress, which causes greater molecular friction and therefore higher temperatures. When moist winds blow over a mountain range on the windward side, then energy is released in cloud formation or condensation, and it causes the air to cool slowly. By the time the air reaches the top of the mountains, it has lost most of its moisture content due to precipitation. However, as the winds blow down the lee side of the mountain, dry air warms up very quickly and absorbs the moisture, causing relatively warm and dry conditions on the lee side of mountains. The coastal ranges in the Pacific Northwest are a perfect example of this. Wet, cold weather is common along the coast. The Cascade Range of the Rocky Mountains receive a great deal of rain and snow as the air rises over the mountains. Inland on the lee side of the mountain ranges creates a drier and warmer conditions. This is why, for example, the wheat belt in the Inner Mountain West occurs on the eastern sides of Oregon and Washington. Cloud droplets and ice crystals are small enough to remain suspended in the air by air currents indefinitely. However, if these droplets or crystals come together or coalesce, they, morph, they form larger droplets or ice crystals that fall out of the air as precipitation. Because these cloud droplets form around bits of dust or other condensation nuclei, they bring these particles down to the Earth's surface and clean the atmosphere of dust and other pollutants during precipitation. As a result, the atmosphere becomes more transparent following precipitation and therefore visibility increases. So you can see further. Okay, so that is the weather factors and we will cover weather patterns in the next lecture. I hope you have a great day.